Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mario. Welcome back to the channel. So good to have you here. If you're new here, just understand the theme of this channel is we are real apostolics with real problems, with real solutions, all solved in a divine way. I am your host, Mario. And today we're going to do another reaction video. Just got home from a, a great music practice uh, with the boys and saw this video come through my feed earlier today and I really wanted to watch it just based off the title that says who and how many will go to heaven. We all know our ultimate goal is uh, we don't want to stay part of this world anymore. Uh, at, least, at least us apostolics and Christians do. We want to go where God is and just such an interesting title. It's such a big debate always when you talk about heaven and hell and and who's going to go and, and if you did this are you going to go to hell if you didn't do this you're going to go to hell or, or or if you did these things you'll go to heaven whatever the case may be so i just thought this is a super super interesting title i have no idea what it's going to be about hopefully it's something good hopefully a lot of content can be taken from this but uh, before we get into that uh, make sure you like and subscribe to this channel uh, make sure that you put your comments down below. Let me know which parts you think are, are the best or, or worst parts of this video. I love your all's feedback. Put videos down below of what you want to see me comment on. Let us press that play button. Who will go to heaven? How many will go to heaven? If we answered these questions by all the funerals that we've attended throughout our lives, we'd have to say that everybody will be there. There'll hardly be a single soul mm. left out. But will it really be that way? Well, not if you believe. Ooh, he, he really brings up a good point there. Because he's right. Every funeral, they talk about, you know, we wish you well. One day we'll see you in heaven. But will that be the case? That's super interesting. I love that point. The wide and narrow gates. Let's get into it. Our Lord Jesus, our Lord put the question of heaven in an entirely different light declaring, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus tells us that mm. most people who live and die in this world will not go to heaven. Most doctors will not go there. Most school teachers, most professional athletes, most plumbers, most carpenters, most businessmen, most news anchors, most farmers, most computer technicians, most Americans, most Africans, most Asians, most Hispanics, most... Okay, I think you get the idea. Most people are not going to make it to heaven according to Jesus Christ. He uses the illustration... Wow. When you put it in that perspective, right? When you say most in general, it's just like a blanket statement. It doesn't really mean anything to you. But when he starts listing out all these occupations, most doctors, most policemen, most businessmen, most firemen, most school teachers, and he just starts listing and listing. And then you start putting in your mind all these, all these smaller groups of people that you either know or have heard of. Most of them are not going to heaven. I always thought it was interesting and I always thought of it this way of who's going to go to heaven. I guess what's like the quantitative number we could put. As you know, like the top 3% are always the most successful in, in every field, right? The top 3% usually dominate, most, make the most money. I wonder if that's going to how it's going to be when God looks down on heaven, looks down from heaven. Is there going to be like this 3% that truly followed the narrow gate, that truly followed the narrow way, that that truly repented, that truly got baptized in Jesus' name, that truly were filled with the Holy Ghost, that truly lived a holy lifestyle all the way until the end, and then the other 97% will fall away. Comment down below. Let me know what you think about that. If it's going to be like a 3%, the top of the top, that happens in every field, right? If that's going to apply in like a heavenly standard, um, it's scary to think about. It's really scary to think about that because we're talking about eternity, right? We're not talking about something like you fail and you get another try. This is like it. This is the one chance. And God is just in doing that. You have two gates to demonstrate this truth. One gate is wide and people are constantly swarming through it. Masses of people lining up in a never-ending throng, moving toward everlasting destruction. 
in a different place leading to an entirely different and vastly superior destination, there is another gate, but it is small and narrow. Just a handful of people seem interested in going through this gate to enjoy what's on the other side. This is how Jesus describes the difference between those who will enter heaven when they die and those who will take that dark route that leads to what he refers to as outer darkness and everlasting destruction. In short, Jesus is telling us that there'll be a whole lot more people who end up in a terrible place of darkness when their lives are over than those who enter heaven, regardless of what well-meaning friends may confidently assert at their funerals. Why is this? It's not that God doesn't want lots of children. He assuredly does. But this does not change the fact that God only allows one kind of people into heaven. Jesus states, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God cares nothing about our race, nationality, or culture. He doesn't prefer educated children over ignorant ones or highly successful All types right, over right, those who right. can barely hang on to their lowly jobs. What he does care about and cares about intensely is whether we've received his gift of righteousness. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We might wonder why more people don't come to genuine faith in Jesus. After all, our message is a pleasant one. God loves you. God wants to forgive you and provide for you and be your heavenly Father. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, at the end of your life, you'll go to heaven and live with Him forever. It's a great message, and who could really reject such an invitation? And yet... All right. Correction there. If you get baptized in Jesus' name, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, repent of your sins live a holy lifestyle all the way to the very end, meaning you are pursuing a life away from sin, pursuing a life away from this world to see Jesus, those will get into heaven. I, I don't know this guy. I don't know what he believes, but there is such, there is this, and I, I primarily see this in the Baptist church, of this idea that you Say a prayer and accept God into your heart as your Lord and Savior, and that's it. It's a one-time prayer. It's, it's, a, it's a grace forever prayer. You can't fall away, no matter how far you get away from God, and that's all it takes. But that's so easy, right? Like, again, thinking of the top 3% of anything, right? Let's just think about, in perspective, the NBA, how many NBA players are actively playing right now? We'll say about 400. 400 of the most athletic of the athletic basketball players that competed since they were elementary to middle to high school standouts to college standouts or some opted away from college to get into the league. It's such a small, small number. And they could tell you it was not easy. So why would God right? Who has this, who has standards he wants us to follow, just make it so easy for us, right? If it was just a prayer and you could go back to living the way you lived, you're right. I think that'd be very attractive. And it is very attractive. And that's the most popular belief, but nowhere in the Bible was that prayer ever said. And that's the problem that I've got with this idea of praying to God and accepting him as your Lord and Savior. There is no biblical evidence behind it. But there is biblical evidence behind baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and doing away with your old life. Millions and billions do. There are several reasons for this, but one of the major ones centers around the concept of bias. To put it plainly, if we're obsessed with living an immoral life, the last thing in the world we would want would be for the Bible to be true and Jesus to be exactly who he says he is. The saying goes, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. People who do not want to believe in Jesus will find a thousand different reasons not to believe in Jesus or to believe in him with some anemic, wimpy, casual belief which doesn't change the heart 
and leaves them in the same ungodly lifestyle they've come to know and love. In the end, we'll typically believe what we want to believe. And if you're determined to maintain the selfish, ungodly status quo in your life, you will not want to believe in Jesus. Not at all. Amazingly, in spite of this, people do find Christ and are born again. The narrow gate is not so crowded as the wide gate, but neither is it deserted. You'll find small groups going through steadily, men and women who are brought out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. Perhaps as we're entering that narrow gate at the conclusion of our lives, we may find some of our friends in line just before or after us who will turn and thank us for opening our mouths and not keeping our light hidden under a basket. I want to see our you there. crowd at the narrow gate may be relatively small, but if we can do our part to increase our little line, it will be worth every effort, every dollar, every prayer, every time we overcome our nervousness and open our mouths about Jesus. Like the Apostle Paul, we do it for the elect's sake. Mm. I love it. I actually think he ended really well. And just understand everything that we go through when we're pursuing Christ, being imperfect as we are, it is for his honor and his glory. And it all is worth it. It's all worth it to be made fun of, to be the outcast. Because at the end of the day, you're the one that's inheriting the true riches. You're the one inheriting eternal life and going to a place as described in Revelations as streets of gold. Just a beautiful, I think there was one part that listed like 14 different type of precious stones all layered, right? I mean, just something, you just, just the most beautiful place you can think of on earth, multiply it by God, right? And, and that's what heaven is for us. So uh, I thought that was a really great video here. Again, you heard my, my uh, three cents on it, um, on some of the parts that I think were a little iffy there. But uh, as you know, Let's, uh, let's keep this uh, YouTube train rolling. Comment down below um, of what you think, in your opinion, of what's the, most, what's the biblical way that you need to be, sa be saved. Am I right? Am I wrong? Comment down below. would love to hear what you all have to say. But anyways, thank you all for watching. God bless you. Peace.